This week, we are exploring a varietal native to Northern Italy that can be made into a lot of different styles of wine depending on some of the unique winemaking methods employed in this particular area. And in this week's tip of the week, we're gonna talk about some of these unique terms we find on Italian wine labels and hopefully make it a little bit easier to pick out a bottle of Italian wine. All of that, coming up next. Hello, welcome to Wine This Week with Scott Leake. This week we're reviewing a varietal known as Corvina. Most of us haven't heard of Corvina, but we certainly know the region that it comes from. Inside the northern Italian region of the Vento is a smaller region that we all know called Valpolicella. And Valpolicella is by far the most fun region to pronounce. Go ahead and say it with me. Valpolicella. I mean, that's just awesome. I know I probably sound like I'm auditioning for the live action version of Super Mario Brothers with that pronunciation, but it's just, it's just awesome to say. What's really interesting about Corvina is that this varietal is used mostly in blends in the Valpolicella wines, but it's used with a minimum and a maximum requirement, which I don't know that I've seen in any other area before. So it needs to be somewhere between 40 and 70% of the composition of the wines of Valpolicella. There's another region called Bard uh, Bardellino that is nearby that uses Corvina as well. But other than that, this is pretty much the only place in the world you're gonna find this grape. Also blended in with this one, it's 70% Corvina, and this one happens to have 25% Rodinella. And those two are the primary grape varietals. There's a couple more indigenous ones, but those are the two that, that you need to know. And again, most Valpolicella wines are gonna be mostly Corvina. So that's why we're reviewing this today. Now here's where the wines of Valpolicella get really interesting. So you've got a basic one like this, and then there is Valpolicella Superiore, there's Valpolicello Classico. I'll go over these in the tip of the week. There's a step up, if you will, with the Amarone della Valpolicello. So maybe you've heard of Amarone before. Amarone is made in a really unique method, and it actually was kind of made by accident. There's another one called Recioto della Valpolicella. They're both made in the same way with one little difference. So the Recioto wines were first made by taking the Corvina grapes and harvesting them, putting them out on these mats and drying them for months. So the water content within each grape would shrink from about, they'd lose about 30 to 50% of their, of their water, leaving just lots of concentrated sugars and flavors. You'd get some kind of raisiny, as you'd imagine, or prune or dried fig flavors and they would press those grapes and make a wine like you would make a regular old wine. But the grapes are significantly different with a lot of that water loss and the concentration of the flavors. The Recioto version, they would actually stop fermentation before all of the sugars were consumed. And so you'd have a wine of moderate alcohol and a lot of sweet and flavorful characteristics. And it was believed that Amarone was made on accident when someone stopped, forgot to stop fermentation and it went ahead and processed all those sugars. Then you got, when you don't process all the sugar or when you do ferment all the sugar, you get a lot of alcohol. So Amarones tend to be 15, 60% alcohol, big, bold. Uh, these are some of the fullest body wines you can imagine and really interesting, complex flavors very age-worthy uh, Amarones are spectacular. I'll have to do a video in the future on just Amarone in particular and, and do a tasting of that because they're some of my favorite wines. Then there is this other thing where they'll take all of those skins, so after they have fermented or macerated it, they'll take the leftover skins of an Amarone or a Recioto and they will mix them in with a batch of Valpolicello for a little while and this is called a Rapasso wine. This whole process is known as a passiamento. But when you take the must, the pumice, whatever you want to call it, from the making of an Amarone, and you pass through the still wine of a plain old Valpolicella, you get these Rapasso wines. So it's like kind of a halfway point between a big bomb Amarone and a more light drinking, easygoing Valpolicella. So, Here's this one little region with just a couple of indigenous grapes making all these different styles of wine in a way that not many other places in the world do. And that's what makes Valpolicella such a cool place. 
Let's taste some Corvina. Nice color. It's a little bit deeper than I expected it to be. I'm going to call this a deep ruby. It's still not quite in a garnet range, but you guys can take a look at it there. It's really nice. That's really pretty. Um, I can already kind of smell this, so I'm going to already say this has got some pronounced aromas. Yeah, nice. As is common with Valpolicella wines, uh, a lot of sour cherry on the nose. Maybe a little bit of red plum as well. There's, I don't want to call it cigar box, but there's this cedar smell that just uh, kind of reminds me of, of like the, the chips you'd put in your, your smoker on, on the grill. See, I'm just going to call them cedar chips. A little bit of pepper, but it's not peppery. It's not spicy. There's kind of some baking spices and just kind of a mild, maybe it's a white pepper. Overall, it's a nice nose. Let's taste it. That's, that is a very refreshing wine. I like a lot of the elements going on here. Quick side note too. I'm drinking this at cellar temperature. I'm drinking this at 55. It's kind of on that slightly chilled uh, realm. Gamay, which we'll have here in a couple weeks. Pinot Noir, Valpolicella. These lighter bodied red wines, I like lightly chilled. It's okay to have these things a little bit colder than a Cabernet or an Amarone, for example. Uh, there's a lot on, on this uh, that caught me by surprise. So number one, uh, first of all, it's dry and I expected that. Tannins I thought would be a little bit less than this and I got just right on the inside of, of my, my lower jaw, just this nice drying sensation, but it was kind of these soft, fine tannins. I really enjoyed it. So I'm gonna call it medium minus, medium rare on the tannin level. Uh, the acidity is nice and high and that's typically the case with uh, a Valpolicella. There's a little hint of alcohol, um, not bad. This is this is medium alcohol, and I think this is 13, 13%. Nice alcohol, fitting for what this wine is. It is a light-bodied wine. There's not a whole lot of weight to it, but again, it's refreshing. And you know what? You don't want a heavy wine that's trying to be refreshing. <laughs> The flavor intensity on it was was more medium. The, the nose was more pronounced. There's still plenty coming through. The sour cherries are definitely there and it's specifically sour cherries that I'm tasting. The red plum is there. And there is a little bit of the hint of the nose of that cedar that I got on the palate as well. I don't know that I wanna say the pepper was there. It's fairly simple. Simple can be good. Fairly short on the finish. I mean, not like 10 seconds, but it's not 30 either. We'll call it a 20 second finish. This is a good wine. Um, I like the balance. The, the acidity is pretty high. The alcohol is low. The fruit is, is there. It's fairly well balanced. So I'm gonna give it a couple points for that. The length, you know, it was all right, not great. Uh, the intensity of the flavors, decent. Give it a little bit of credit there. The complexity is not terribly high. So all in, I'm going to call this a 6.1 on a you know, 10 point scale. Very good. Very refreshing. A lot of things you can do with this and, and certainly a wine you could just sit and sip and enjoy your day with it. One of the things that intimidates me the most about buying a bottle of wine from a foreign country is I don't often understand the language being used on the bottle. And there's a lot of different terms that could mean a bunch of different things. So let's spend a few minutes kind of demystifying the Italian wine label. First thing of note is this bottle here has this ribbon around it with a little blue coloring. This one has the gold coloring. By the way, sometimes they might go straight down. They don't necessarily always go around the neck, but you can usually find it on the neck somewhere. The blue 
is the wine of a DOC classification. The gold is the DOCG. It actually does have those letters on there as well. But just, just to understand when you see those, that might give you a little indication of the quality of the wine. We talked about the DOC versus DOCG last week in Cortese, so go back and watch that if you want a quick refresher on it. The other thing that you might note, so this Suave and the Chiani, these are both Classico. So it says Suave Classico or Chiani Classico. Classico refers to the region in a sense. Classico means it is the center or the heartland, the, the original area of that region. So in Chiani, for example, one day somebody said, hey, we're making some good wines here and we're making some money off it. So let's expand, let's plant some vines in other places and, and kind of annex some areas around us. Typically what happens in that case though, is that the original vines were planted on slopes in the best areas with the right amount of sunlight, the right amount of nutrients and drainage. And these were where great, great wines were made. And when they start to expand, they maybe go to areas that aren't quite as great as the original, but they still called it Chiani. Well, at some point in time, somebody said, we need to differentiate these a little bit. So if you see the word Classico, know that that is the original kind of center region and maybe is a little bit better quality because for one, because of the slope and um, you know the aspect and everything with those, they're probably having to hand harvest them. Whereas if they're on a flat area and in the non-classical region of Chiani or Suave, those are gonna be able to be machine harvested. So Classico can give you a little bit of an indication of higher quality, probably higher price as well. Now, this is just a Suave Classico. This is a Chiani Classico Reserva. So the word reserva means that they reserved or held back some of the wines to be aged. In certain countries, the term reserva doesn't mean anything. In Chile, it doesn't mean anything. Maybe they held back some, but there's no requirements as to how long it has to be held back. In Italy, there is requirements, but unfortunately for us, it varies based on region. So a Chiani Classico reserva has to be aged and held back for 27 months. An Amarone reserva has to be held back for four years. So each region has its own rules as to what Reserva means, but just know that it is held back and is aged and therefore it's gonna have some more tertiary aromas and flavors. It's a good, likely, a good uh, likelihood that the wine is probably of higher quality when it's got the Reserva label. I'm not gonna say that's always the case, but in Italy, most of the time you can assume a Reserva is a bit of a high, higher quality. Now, the Valpolicella that I have here is the most basic one that Allegrini makes. They also make one that looks exactly like this, but right below it says the word Superiore. And Superiore, kind of like Reserva, might mean that it's been aged a little bit. They can almost be used interchangeably in that regard, but a Superiore predominantly means that it's got a higher alcohol content requirement and a lower yield production requirement. So we talked about yields in a previous video real quick. Basically what that means is fewer clusters of grapes on a single vine, more energy and nutrients go to each grape. Each grape gets fuller, riper, more flavor. So a Superiore having lower yield on each vine and um, having a higher alcohol content, the higher alcohol content comes from the grapes being a little bit riper, more full, more flavorful. So it is another term to help you maybe sense that, yeah, this wine might be a higher quality, might be a little bit more expensive. So I would say those are the three terms to look for when you're buying an Italian wine. Look for Superiore, look for Classico, or even look for Classico and Reserva. Any of those are gonna indicate to you this is probably a bit higher quality wine. Hopefully this makes it a little bit more pleasant to pick out an Italian bottle next time. Thank you for watching another episode of Wine This Week. I hope you enjoyed. If so, please like and subscribe. Join me next week as we move on to the region of Piedmont, also in northern Italy, just a little bit to the west of Valpolicella, to the region of Alba, where we will be having a dolcetto. Almost as fun to say as Valpolicella, but I'll work on it. Until then, keep trying new wines, and as always, cheers. <laughs>